So it's no secret that our lifestyles are becoming more and more dependent on stable electricity. But have you ever wondered how our electric grid will be able to handle the explosive growth in energy demand that's just around the corner? Most of our US electric grid was built in the 1960s and 1970s, and our infrastructure is struggling to keep up with our modern electric needs. So what's the future look like? It seems obvious that we just need a bigger, better, more reliable grid. I mean, if we need more power, let's just build more power plants. But it's starting to look like the future of our electric grid might be going virtual. And by leveraging home batteries, systems, solar panels, and software, there's a path forward to help save more than $10 billion per year on grid costs and actually put that money back in your pocket. But it's not just about the money. There's a bigger problem that we're trying to solve, and that's reliability. And it's easy to feel like it's not our problem to solve. It's the utility companies. But what if we could actually be a part of the solution? What if instead of just being a power consumer, we can actually become the power plant? In this video, we're gonna answer three main questions. First, we're gonna quickly review some challenges facing our electric grid today. What are these problems and why do they matter? Second, let's discuss the future of our electric grid. What could it look like and how it might transform? And then third, how could these changes directly benefit us as individual consumers? Let's get into it. And for those new to the channel, thanks for stopping by. My name is Zach. I've been in the solar industry for about 10 years now. Here we talk about solar batteries and really the entire energy industry as a whole. If that's content that you typically enjoy, then subscribe for more. I'd really appreciate it. Now, the process of electrification has become one of the biggest issues that our grid is running into. We continue to electrify our homes and our lifestyles, but we're also electrifying our transportation. The sheer growth of total energy consumption poses its own set of problems, but an issue that looms even larger is balancing our energy demand. To simplify things, our grid essentially sees two types of energy demand, base demand and peak demand. Our base demand is that minimum level of electricity load that is required day to day. This will vary with some seasonality, of course, depending on how hot or cold it is in your area. Think of this base demand as your lights, refrigeration, electronics, and all of those standard use items that are powered on more frequently if not all the time. This is essentially the resting heart rate of your home. Many of our traditional power plants are designed to cover this base load, which is usually more predictable and easier to forecast. Resources of these power plants can be both renewable and non-renewable, from nuclear to natural gas to solar energy. Now above our base demand, we have our peak demand. Think of peak demand like traffic that we see on the roads and freeways during the rush hour times of day. Naturally, the grid will see more congestion when more people are home using heavier electrical items. These heavier loads could be your heating or cooling system, your oven, oven, stove top, hot water heater, TVs, and of course, your electric vehicle. Ultimately, as our peak demand continues to increase, utilities must also scale up the total available supply to be able to meet that maximum demand. The higher it goes, the bigger the problem. Now, to meet this real-time increase in energy demand, utilities will call upon peaking power plants to fill this void, also known as peaker plants. A peaker plant is a power plant that grid operators will use during these times of exceptionally high electricity demand. Currently in the US, we have just over 1,000 peaker plants in use, many of which create a lot of air pollution in lower income areas. To better understand peaker plants, it's key to recognize that not all energy generation is created equal. Grid operators will typically prioritize power sources based on their marginal cost, which makes sense. They're a business too. As shown in the chart on the screen, when energy demand skyrockets, the grid turns to these higher cost resources, typically from peaker plants, which are often more reliant on fossil fuels. However, some of these resources may not have as much flexibility to quickly meet the sharp increase in energy demand. Gas turbines, for example, are common in peaker plants because they can start up and ramp quickly when the grid needs extra power. Now, these moments may only account for less than 5% of the total time in the year, so on the surface, it doesn't seem like that bad of a resolution. But there are two problems. First, they're very expensive. Despite how little they may be used, grid operators still spend a lot of money to maintain and operate these peaker plants to be at the ready for those dangerous moments of peak demand. Here's the second problem. Peak demand on our grid is growing for the first time in 10 years, according to the Department of Energy. We're expected to see a 60 gigawatt increase by 2030, and then another 250 gigawatt increase by 2050. For context, a gigawatt is equal to 1 billion watts of power, and 60 gigawatts of demand is roughly equivalent to the supply of 200 150 peaker plants, which is enough to power about 45 million households. So these aren't small numbers that we're talking about here. And as we covered in this video recently, which I linked in the description below, solar panels alone don't really solve the problem for utility providers. Solar is not a flexible power resource since it's 100% dependent on a very inflexible resource, the sun. But when we integrate solar panels with battery storage, we then create that flexibility that we need. The strategy for most today is store excess solar energy throughout the day in your battery system, and then dispatch that energy when needed, either based on a predetermined schedule 
or based on your real-time energy needs. As we've discussed before on this channel, more and more utilities are shifting towards time of use plans where they will charge energy users a premium for energy use during certain peak times of the day and the year. Utilities will also offer a significant discount if you shift your energy use to those quieter times of day, usually referred to as off-peak. For EV owners, it's very common for utility providers to offer plans that have even lower rates on electricity that's consumed during that very late evening time frame or early morning time frame. So between these solar panels, battery systems, and the available rate discounts, this all works fantastically to incentivize homeowners to shift their energy demand appropriately and reduce their individual grid dependence. But what about everybody else? Homeowners don't invest in rooftop solar and home battery solutions for their neighbors or their utility provider. We do it for ourselves. That's where virtual power plants or VPPs come into play. VPPs are an intelligent solution that can benefit both individual consumers and the larger grid. And while VPPs are nothing new to some parts of the world in the US, the adoption has continued to increase out of necessity but is this really the future of our grid and how could it even benefit you as a consumer? Let's start with the fundamentals. Virtual power plants are networks of decentralized energy resources, typically from individual homeowners, solar and battery systems like a Tesla Powerwall. Basically, it's a crowdsourced power plant that leverages clean energy and its main objective is reduce the need for these peaker plants. These energy resources will all work together through software to essentially act as a single power plant to help increase our supply during the periods of high demand. Additionally, VPPs aren't limited to just solar and batteries. Consumers can also participate in some areas with smart thermostats, smart water heaters, electric vehicle charging, and so on to help reduce energy consumption on the demand side. For utilities, the end goal is the same, either increase energy supply or decrease energy demand during these times with both occurring being an ideal outcome. Here in 2024, the Department of Energy estimates current VPP capacity to be between 30 and 60 gigawatts. If we're able to triple our VPP capacity by 2030, not only would this help address our national capacity needs, but could also save roughly $10 billion in annual grid costs. All of this sounds great for the utilities, but what's in it for the consumers? Sure, VPPs will offer a lot of benefit when it comes to sustainability and grid reliability, but the real needle mover is going to come down to one thing money. And by participating in a VPP, rather than the utilities needing to call on these peaker plants to cover the increase in energy demand, they could utilize the network of home batteries and smart devices to accomplish the same outcome. But more importantly, utilities want to pay VPP participants directly for their contributions. The money is shifting from the power plants to the consumers. Currently, if your utility offers it and your equipment setup qualifies, you can enroll in a VPP in your area and allow the utility to have some level of control over your battery, but you get paid a premium for that energy. It's important to note too, just because you're enrolled in a VPP doesn't mean you have to participate in every event. You do have the option to opt out. If you do want to participate but not drain your entire battery, you can set a higher backup reserve within your battery's app to allocate some energy to the utility, but save the rest for yourself. Tesla right now is one of the most prominent players in the VPP space since they have both the hardware and the software. Earlier in 2024, the Tesla Powerwall fleet delivered more than 100 megawatts of clean power to the grid during a VPP event, which helped reduce the need for fossil-fueled peaker plants. Through the VPP, participants received $2 per kilowatt hour that they supplied during an emergency event. That means the payouts were $200,000 per hour, which that money gets reallocated back towards the consumer rather than the power plant. In some other markets, like in Texas, rather than getting paid a flat rate for their energy like we saw in the California example, participants will get paid based on real-time market pricing, which can increase the payout per kilowatt hour even higher if the grid really needs your support. Support. Outside of formal VPPs, there are utilities that will offer premium export rates during predetermined peak hours. Some utilities might be simpler than others. Others, like California with their NEM 3.0, can be very granular with these export rates, as you can see on the screen here. As of now, there are a few time slots in the late summer that can yield homeowners more than $3 per kilowatt hour. Other times of the day throughout the year, you might be lucky to get a single penny back for an exported kilowatt hour. Now, similar to VPPs, this arrangement also provides homeowners who have battery storage the opportunity opportunity to dump their kilowatt hours onto the grid when the export rates are at their highest. It's essentially like day trading electricity with the energy providers and you become the power plant. What's cool too in the future, VPPs likely won't be limited to just solar and battery systems. The hopes are it can even expand to electric vehicles with bi-directional charging where your vehicle can help supply power back to the grid during these times of high demand. With this, the electric vehicle can pivot from being an energy burden to becoming a resource of energy flexibility. Now we hinted at this earlier, but a Another underlying benefit beyond the environmental and financial gains is through VPPs, we see the opportunity to increase our overall grid reliability. By transitioning our energy 
dependence from traditional centralized power plants to a more decentralized solution, we remove that central point of reliance. Puerto Rico is a great example of this. Due to its remote location, Puerto Rico has been long associated with having an unreliable grid. Because of that, VPPs have gained significant traction of late from leading solar providers like Tesla, Sunrun, and Sonova. The VPP will help make solar and battery storage even more economical, but they will also offer critical support to help stabilize the grid and reduce power outages. And Puerto Rico isn't alone here. During the past decade, the U.S. has dealt with 60% more weather-related outages during the warmer months than we did throughout the 2000s. Beyond natural disasters, heat waves and wildfires can also be a cause of these grid failures. This can leave a lot of people vulnerable during a time of year when they may need electricity most, mainly for their AC unit. Of course, as an individual user, you can solve the problem for yourself by installing a solar and battery system to give your home the ultimate insurance against grid failures. So on paper, this may all sound great, but what challenges do virtual power plants face? The biggest challenge ahead is adoption, both from consumers and utilities. Change takes time, but demand may force the issue out of necessity. If it's possible, utilities would much rather coordinate existing energy resources than have to build up supply infrastructure. We're seeing adoption increase in these key areas of the world because of that. They may be areas where the grid is more fragile, energy demand is more volatile, or the cost of delivering energy is just so expensive during peak times of day. Historically, homeowners and businesses have opted for solar and battery storage for energy savings, blackout protection, and to take advantage of time of use rate plans. But with virtual power plants, there's a whole new level of strategy in play, and it's one that ties directly in how utilities are managing the energy game. I really think this is the future for solar and battery owners, and it's why I'm so bullish on the solution beyond the typical benefits that get discussed. Utilities save money, consumers get paid, rates get reduced, and the grid becomes more reliable for everyone involved. Now, if you enjoyed this video and you want to learn more about why utility companies are changing the game for the rooftop solar industry, check out this video here on the screen. Subscribe for more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys next time.